Most people know Konami as a home console developer, but did you know that Konami has a rich history of developing games for the arcade? In this episode of The Big Retro Show, I talk about some of Konami's lesser known arcade games that everyone should be playing. The first game I'm going to get into is Gaiopolis. Released in 1993, Gaiopolis puts you in the role of one of three heroes. There's the Knight Gerard, the Fairy Elaine, and the Dragon Dude named Galahad. Each has a bone to pick with the evil Zarhark Empire and its King of Darkness. Gaiopolis can be best described as an overhead beat-em-up that can be played with a friend or on your own. The gameplay is similar to most in the beat-em-up genre. Each character has their own weapon they wield against their enemies, and a special dash attack that they can use when in a pinch. You traverse the game's whopping 17 stages taking out enemies and bosses. You are guided through this game by the mysterious spirit known as a Warrior of Flame, who tells you that you must find three keys sprinkled throughout the land to open the doorway that leads to Gaiopolis, where the King of Darkness awaits. Aside from your regular attack, you can use magic attacks to kill enemies, as well as a special egg that contains companion charms that will boost your attack power. The companions include a roly-poly dude, a small dragon, and a tiny dude who bonks people over the head with his mallet. It's a nice touch that adds a little bit of fun to the gameplay. As you defeat enemies, you earn experience points that you can use to level up, increasing your health. The game's graphics are colorful and well drawn and the sounds are great. The game isn't too difficult, however, you will be spending a lot of quarters trying to defeat the game's 17 stages. One cool thing about this game is that it lets you continue your game with a password. This is not something often seen in arcade games and I thought it was a nice touch. Gaiopolis did not receive any official home ports, but an unlicensed version for the Famicom was made and you can probably find it online if you try. It's no secret that Konami made some of the best shoot-em-ups, and Salamander 2 was one of my favorites. Salamander 2 is a 3D upgraded sequel to the excellent Salamander, also known as Life Force in the US, released in the arcades in 1986. In Salamander 2, you pilot the Vic Viper or the Super Cobra and take on wave after wave of colorful but deadly enemies across six stages in both horizontal and vertical viewpoints. The game mixes up the combat a bit from its predecessor. The little ships that increase your firepower, known as options in the first Salamander, make a return in this sequel. However, in Salamander 2, you can use them as projectile weapons that cause heavy damage to your enemies. Anyone who has played a shoot 'em up knows that you have to kill everything in sight while avoiding bullets and the environmental dangers. And Salamander 2 is no different. I always seem to enjoy these games a lot more when I'm fully powered up. My world comes crashing down, however, when I get shot and lose all my power. But the game lets you recapture your options at least if you are fast enough, so at least there's that. Salamander 2 isn't too difficult and totally beatable if you have the quarters for it. The game was never directly ported as a standalone game, however it was bundled along with the original Salamander and Life Force into the Salamander Deluxe Pass Plus for the Japanese Sega Saturn and the PlayStation, and in the Salamander Portable game for the Japanese PSP. A copy of the Salamander Deluxe Pass Plus for the Japanese Saturn goes for $82 complete in box or $72 loose. A copy of the game for the Japanese PlayStation goes for $90 complete in box or $86 loose. The Japanese PSP Salamander Portable goes for $82. Love me some running guns and Konami's surprise attack hits the spot. The game was released in the arcades in 1990 and you take on the role of a space dude named John Ryan 
who must take out a group of terrorists who have taken over the moon base and its neighboring space station for their own nefarious purposes. The game plays very much like two other great run and guns, Shinobi and Rolling Thunder. The gameplay consists of you donning a spacesuit and shooting enemies with your firearm that the game calls a disc while you make your way through the levels. Your mission in each level is to find and disarm several bombs that the enemy has planted and to defeat several bosses that appear in the game. The gunplay and surprise attack is satisfying but could have used some variety in the weapons, a la Contra, another game made by Konami. Your main and only weapon is your handgun called your normal disc. You can power it up to a grenade disc which increases its power and makes your bullet even larger. Aside from that one power up there aren't any other weapons you can use. It's not a deal breaker, but just a bummer. As you make your way through the levels, you can find a power up that will turn you invincible for a while and let you fly around killing enemies. In Surprise Attack, you can jump up to higher platforms, much like you can do in Shinobi, and certain levels require you to walk on the ceiling using anti-gravity boots to take out enemies. While this is an interesting gameplay mechanic, it's one that wore thin on me, especially when trying to jump over these damn flame things. The graphics and sound of Surprise Attack are fitting for the game, and the character sprites that the programmers use are cool to look at. The game is definitely a quarter muncher and will put your skills to the test. Surprise Attack did not receive any home console ports, so if you find it out in the wild, definitely put some quarters into it. With popular games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and X-Men, Konami sealed his legacy as one of the most prolific beat-em-up developers of all time. But the road to beat-em-up greatness was also paved by games like Crime Fighters and its sequel, Vendetta. Vendetta is a direct sequel to the underappreciated Crime Fighters, and its mission is quite simple. Rescue your gal who was just kidnapped by a rival gang. You pick from four members of the Cobra gang, including this one dude who looks like Hulk Hogan, each with their own fighting styles. You can choose from the X Prize Fighter Blood, Hawk, the aforementioned Hulkster looking dude, Boomer, the martial artist, and Sledge, the ex military convict, who just happens to be the most worthless out of the quintet. The action in Vendetta is familiar. You can punch and kick the crap out of your enemies and pull off combo moves to add to the damage. The game also lets you wield weapons such as a shotgun and a spiked bat that you can use to even the odds against your enemies. Each of the game's six stages has scores of enemies for you to fight as well as an end boss. I should note that the sixth stage involves beating up all of the previous bosses you defeated. One of the game's charms are its characters. The game has lots of homages to other games such as Final Fight and the bosses are fun to look at and fight. The game's graphics and sound effects add to the satisfying feeling of beating the crap out of your enemies. Vendetta improves on nearly every aspect of its prequel Crime Fighters and is a worthy arcade game that you should play at least once. The game was ported over to the PS4 and Switch and you can pick it up for about 8 bucks. If you were to take the run and gun action found in Konami's Sunset Riders and replace cowboys with ninjas, you would have the brilliance that is Mystic Warriors. Released in 1992, Mystic Warriors is an arcade run and gun that shares many of the fun elements that made Sunset Riders so special. Sunset Riders even gets a cameo in Mystic Warriors. How cool is that? As the story goes, you are part of a ninja clan and one of your own has been kidnapped by the evil Skull Enterprise. The game takes place in a dystopian version of New York in which the skulls rule. From the start, you can choose one of five ninjas in your clan. As soon as you choose your ninja, one of your comrades is kidnapped and your adventure begins. Mystic Warriors allows you to play with up to three friends depending on the arcade cabinet configuration you are playing on. There are two and four player versions of this cabinet. Mystic Warriors gameplay is similar to that of Sunset Riders. You run through the stages throwing ninja stars at enemies and gaining power-ups to help beef up your shots. One way in which the game differs from Sunset Riders is that you can use melee attacks against your enemies, which comes in handy when the enemies are close. Each stage is punctuated by a boss fight, which aren't too difficult to defeat and quite satisfying. 
The gameplay is broken up by skiing, water, and train levels. It's a nice way to add a bit of variety to the game and one that I think Sunset Riders could have done more of. The game is a bit sad though as the joy when you rescue your kidnapped comrade is short lived. I won't spoil what happens but know that you are going to cry. Mystic Warrior's sounds and graphics are top notch and you will have plenty of eye candy to look at while playing this game. It's really quite surprising that this game did not receive any home ports. The beat em up goodness continues with Violent Storm. Released in 1993, Violent Storm is a beat em up that borrows heavily, and I am putting that lightly, from Final Fight and other Capcom characters to create some beat em up fun. You play as one of three fighters who must take on the Geld Gang and rescue their friend who has been kidnapped by this Blanca looking dude. You play from the well rounded Wade, Powerhouse Boris, and the quick dude out of the bunch, Kyle. It's a fighter formula that resembles Final Fight, and well, Basically all beat em ups that followed it. The combat action and especially the enemies, moves, food items and life bars made me think I was playing a sequel to Final Fight even though I knew I wasn't. But it's difficult not to think about Final Fight when playing this game. This isn't a bad thing though as Final Fight is a damn good game. As with any beat em up you take on waves of enemies and fight a boss at the end of each stage. Nothing groundbreaking here. That's why I like it. It is a beat em up after all. The game's big character sprites, colors and sounds make the game more enjoyable. The story plot is cliche but then again we don't really need a big reason to pop a quarter in and begin the fight. If you like Final Fight you will also dig Violent Storm. Sadly this game did not receive any home console ports. Have you played this game? I covered Devil World, as it's known in Japan, in a top arcade game to play for Halloween episode of the Big Retro Show, so I won't say too much about it here. The game is an overhead run and gun in which you must fight demons that you unleashed upon the world. The game is unforgiving and is not for the faint of heart. Devil World plays much like Gauntlet in that you have a bunch of monster generators sprinkled throughout the levels and you must take them out or get overrun by the spawn. You play as either Dr. Condor or the archaeologist who unleashed Hell on Earth when he opened a coffin full of ancient demons during a news conference, or Labrina, the reporter gal who covered the event. In the US version of the game, known as Dark Adventure, you get to play as a third character, an archaeologist named Zorlock. I covered the Japanese version of this game because it starts your characters with a projectile weapon. Dr. Condor is armed with a gun and Labrina is armed with a crossbow. You can power up your weapons in this game in the vein of Gradius, where each power up you collect will build up your options and you can click the button when you reach the desired weapon. The US version of the game starts your characters out with melee weapons, a sword, a whip, or in Zorlock's case, a spear. The other big difference with the US and Japanese version is that the Japanese version has more linear gameplay, with each stage having only one exit. The US version levels have multiple exits and you can backtrack in between the levels if you wish. I didn't like that though so I went with the Japanese version. Your goal in each stage is to find the key that will allow you to open the portal to the next world and defeat the bosses. The game isn't too difficult but it ends your playthrough after a select amount of continues. This makes it difficult and it could not find any dip switches that would allow me to continue more than the set amount. This is an enjoyable game nonetheless and definitely one that deserves to be mentioned in this video. Oh my god I love this game and I've never seen anyone talk about it on YouTube. The main event is one of the earliest arcade wrestling games that I connected with back in the day. Released in 1988, the main event is a wrestling game that borrows from the looks of the big name wrestlers such as Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, Hulk Hogan, King Kong Bundy, Haku and several others. How Konami was never sued by the WWE is a mystery to me. At any rate this game is really quite simple. You choose two wrestlers to tag team against another tag team and do some button mashing. 
The game only has two buttons and I best remember the main event from its oversized action button. The action button kicks, punches, grapples and performs your wrestling moves and the tag button is used to switch out your characters. What made this game so special for me was not only the wrestlers but the announcers who would call out the moves and yell during the match. The other thing is that this game was simple, all you had was a big action button to contend with and a tag button that you would occasionally use. I liked it that way. That being said, it's not entirely clear how you grapple your opponent or pull off some of the moves. The Japanese version of the game had a grapple button and I feel it would have been good to have that in the US version. It's not a big deal but I fully realize that I am looking at this game through nostalgia goggles. One thing I like about this game is that you are given energy points and the game is over when your energy points reach zero. You can theoretically lose a match and have about half of your points for the rematch. It definitely beats getting a game over screen if you lose a match. The more quarters you pump into the machine, the more energy you get. If you win a match, you are also awarded with energy. Have you ever played the main event? What do you think? And the final game I'm going to be talking about is the excellent Metamorphic Force. This game takes a nod from its excellent cousin X-Men and is considered one of Konami's greatest beat-em-ups. Metamorphic Force arrived in the arcades in 1993, and the game reminds me sharply of the action involved in Altered Beast. You play as one of four human characters who has the ability to transform into a stronger animal form to take on enemies. As the story goes, a Greek goddess Athena summons you to take on the evil king Death Shadow who is trying to take over the world. The martial artist Ban takes on the form of a minotaur and was my least favorite character to use. Claus is a swordsman who turns into a white werewolf Max, a boxer who turns into a werepanther, and my favorite character is a stocky Ivan who turns himself into a werebear and whips some ass. You start this game in your human form and can turn into your animal form only after hitting a little dude that runs across the screen and drops a golden statue after you hit him. It is highly reminiscent of the little elves you beat up in Golden Axe. You battle through the game's five levels taking on all different types of animal-like enemies. It becomes a lot easier to defeat your enemies in your animal form and if they hit you enough they can make you revert to your human form which usually happens when you are about to die. Your health is represented by a number that decreases every time you get hit. You can find items throughout the levels that will give you more health. The game's graphics, music and sounds are all top notch and are reminiscent of X-Men's graphics and sounds. The game allows up to 4 players and is an automatic play if you see it out in the wild. And that's gonna do it for this episode of the Big Retro Show. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to the channel, dropping a comment, and leaving a thumbs up. And until the next one, I will see you on the Big Retro Show.